Welcome back to Anatomica. In this session, we will be discussing on the details of development of face, which includes five mesenchymal prominences giving rise to different parts of the face, nose, external ears and palate. The learning objectives of this session are Describe the development of face and palate. Describe the developmental basis of congenital anomalies of face and palate. We have seen already that the development of most of the structures of head and neck region is formed by the mesenchyme which is derived from paraxial mesoderm present adjacent to the neural tube dorsally and notochord ventrally and lateral plate mesoderm which further is split into splanchnopleuric and somatopleuric intraembryonic mesoderm. Also, development of head and neck occurs from neural crest cells and thickened regions of the ectoderm. If you can recall, the neural crest cells are the cells which separate out from the junction of the raised neural tube foldings and the surface ectoderm. The neural crest cells are the major source of connective tissue components like bone, cartilage and ligaments in the facial and oral regions. During the fourth week after formation of head fold, two prominent bulgings appear on the ventral aspect of embryo separated by the depression stomodium or stomatodium. Stomodium is the surface depression formed by ectoderm near the cranial folding of embryo which develops into the oral cavity. Cranially is the developing or primitive brain and the caudal to stomodium is the pericardial bulge or the heart prominence. The floor of stomodium is formed by the buccopharyngeal membrane which separates the stomodium from the primitive pharynx. Facial development depends on the inductive influence of two organizing centers, prosencephalic and rhombencephalic organizing centers. The prosencephalic organizing center is located rostral to the notochord and ventral to the prosencephalon or forebrain, hence the name. The prosencephalic organizing center is derived from the precordal mesoderm which migrates from the primitive streak. The rhombencephalic organizing center is ventral to the rhombencephalon, hence called rhombencephalic organizing center. The five facial primordia which begin to form around the stomodium are the single frontonasal prominence, the paired maxillary prominences and the paired mandibular prominences. Facial prominences start appearing by the end of the fourth week. The prominences primarily consists of mesenchyme derived from neural crest cells which migrate into the pharyngeal arches. Maxillary and mandibular prominences are parts of the first pharyngeal arch. Hence, it is seen that most of the contribution in the development of face is formed mainly by the first pair of pharyngeal arches. At the end of the fourth week, the center of the face is formed by the stomodium, which initially appears a slight depression of the surface ectoderm. The stomodium is separated from the cavity of primordial pharynx by a bilaminar membrane called the oropharyngeal membrane, which is formed by the fusion of ectoderm and endoderm. This membrane ruptures approximately by 26 days. Once the buccopharyngeal membrane ruptures and disappears, 
the amniotic cavity communicates with the primordial pharynx and foregut by 42 days all five mesenchymal prominences can be recognized in the embryo the ventral portion of the first pharyngeal arch the mandibular prominences caudal to the stomodium the maxillary prominences which is the dorsal portion of the first pharyngeal arch present lateral to the stomodium and the frontonasal prominence a slightly rounded elevation cranial to the stomodium in this slide you can observe the scanning electron microscopic picture showing the stomodium developing into the oral cavity and its surrounding structures frontonasal process cranially maxillary processes laterally and mandibular processes caudally the medial ends of the mandibular prominences grow and merge here you can observe in the diagrams how the mandibular processes are merged and form the lower lip and the lower jaw the lower lip and lower jaw are the first parts of the face to develop the mesenchyme covering the ventral part of the brain vesicles proliferate to form the frontonasal prominence this frontonasal prominence formed by proliferation of mesenchyme ventral to the brain vesicles constitutes the upper border of the stomodium so the frontonasal prominence is related to the ventral and lateral parts of the forebrain the frontal part of the frontonasal prominence develops into forehead and the nasal part develops into middle part of upper lip and the nose on both sides of the frontonasal prominence local thickenings of the surface ectoderm the nasal or olfactory placodes originate under inductive influence of the ventral portion of the forebrain let us take enlarged view of only the nasal placodes and see the further development these are the enlarged sections at the development of nasal placodes in the beginning these placodes are convex but during the fifth week the nasal placodes invaginate to form nasal pits the missing chyme in the margins of the placodes proliferates and produces horseshoe shaped elevations which form the medial and lateral nasal processes or prominences the nasal pits form the primordia for the formation of anterior nares or nostrils and nasal cavities now coming back to the frontal views these are the horseshoe shaped elevations or prominences and the depressed nasal pits in the center of the elevations the prominences on the outer edge of the pits form the lateral nasal prominences those on the inner edge form the medial nasal prominences the nasal pits form the primordia developing into the anterior nares or nostrils and nasal cavities during the following two weeks the maxillary prominence continue to increase in size simultaneously the maxillary processes grow medially compressing the medial nasal process towards the midline subsequently the cleft between the medial nasal prominence and the maxillary prominence is lost and the two fuse with each other hence the upper lip is formed in the median plane by two medial nasal processes 
or prominences and the two maxillary prominences on either side forms the lateral part of upper lip. With the formation of the upper lip, the nasal pits are separated from the stomodium. Overall, the superficial parts of face are developed from three prominences. The frontonasal process gives rise to forehead. The medial nasal process gives rise to the crest and tip of the nose, philtrum of upper lip. Lateral nasal process develops into ala of the nose. The maxillary process gives rise to the cheeks, maxilla, lateral parts of the upper lip and jaw. The mandibular process gives rise to the lower lip and lower jaw. Coming to the development of the nasolacrimal duct. Initially, the maxillary prominences and the lateral nasal prominences are separated by a deep furrow or cleft called the nasolacrimal groove. So, these are the nasolacrimal grooves forming between the lateral nasal processes and the maxillary processes as the development proceeds. Let us enlarge the nasolacrimal groove and see its further development. In the floor of the nasolacrimal groove, the ectodermal cells first proliferates to form a solid epithelial cord of cells. This epithelial cord then detaches from the overlying ectoderm. When we take a section across and look at it, this is how it is seen from one end. Now the epithelial cord of cells in the center disappear due to apoptosis that is the programmed cell death and a canal is formed which is called as the nasolacrimal duct. The cranial or upper end of the nasolacrimal duct widens to form the lacrimal sac. Following detachment of the cord from the groove, the maxillary and lateral nasal prominences merge with each other. The nasolacrimal duct then runs from the medial angle of the eye to the inferior meatus of the nasal cavity. The nasolacrimal duct usually becomes completely canalized only after birth. The maxillary processes or prominences enlarge to form the cheeks and maxillae. Laterally, the maxillary prominences merge with the mandibular prominences. As the maxillary prominences grow medially, they cover the lower part of medial nasal process and forms the philtrum. By the end of the sixth week, each maxillary prominence has begun to merge with lateral nasal prominence along the line of the nasolacrimal group. This establishes the continuity between the side of the nose formed by the lateral nasal prominence and the cheek region formed by the maxillary prominence. The primordial lips and cheeks are invaded by myoblasts from the second pharyngeal arches which differentiates into the facial muscles. The myoblasts from the first pair of arches differentiate into the muscles of mastication. The nose is formed from five facial prominences. The frontal prominence gives rise to the bridge of the nose. The merged medial nasal prominence provide the crest and the tip of the nose and the lateral nasal prominences form the sides or ala of the nose. During the sixth week, the nasal pits deepen considerably partly because of the growth of the surrounding nasal prominences 
and partly because of their penetration into the underlying mesenchyme. The deepening of the nasal pits forms the primordial nasal sacs. Each nasal sac grows dorsally ventral to the developing forebrain. At first, the nasal sacs are separated from the oral cavity by the oronasal membrane or buccopharyngeal membrane. The membrane ruptures by the end of the sixth week of development. Now with the rupture of oronasal membrane, the nasal sac and the oral cavities communicate with each other. This communication between the oral and nasal cavities forms the posterior openings of the nasal cavities called the primordial coanae or posterior nares. These coanae lie on each side of the midline and immediately behind the primary palate. Later with formation of the secondary palate and further development of the primitive nasal chambers, the definitive coanae comes to lie at the junction of the nasal cavity and the pharynx. While the coanae are forming simultaneously, the superior, middle and inferior nasal concha develop as elevations from the lateral walls of the nasal cavities. Simultaneously, the ectodermal epithelium in the roof of the nasal cavity becomes specialized to form the olfactory epithelium. Some epithelial cells differentiate into olfactory receptor cells. The axons of these cells constitute the olfactory nerves which grow into the olfactory bulbs of the brain. Now coming to the development of the paranasal air sinuses, it develops as diverticula or outgrowths of the lateral nasal wall and extend into the ethmoid at the roof of nasal cavity next to the developing orbit into the frontal bone anteriorly and sphenoid bones posterior to the nasal cavity. The fourth outgrowth is the extension into the maxilla which cannot be shown in this diagram since it is on the lateral side of the nasal cavity. Most of the paranasal air sinuses are rudimentary or absent at birth in newborns. Only the maxillary sinus begins to develop during late fetal life and other sinuses develop after birth. All the other sinuses reach their maximum size as in adults during puberty and contribute to the definitive shape of the face. The original openings of the diverticula persist as the orifices of the adult sinuses. Growth of the paranasal air sinuses is important in altering the size and shape of the face during infancy and childhood and in adding resonance to the voice during adolescence. By the end of the fifth week, this is with respect to the development of the external ear, six auricular illocks or the mesenchymal swellings, three on each side of the first pharyngeal cleft that is on the mandibular and ioid arches are formed. These are the primordia of the auricle derived from the mesenchymal swellings. The swellings fuse and give rise to external ear. Initially, the external ears are positioned in the neck region. However, as the mandible develops, they ascend to the side of the head and come to lie at the level of the eyes. Till now, we have discussed the development of the superficial parts of the face. Now let us discuss the development of deep parts of the face. 
The horizontal sections shown in these diagrams are taken at the level of A shown as shown in the embryo to get the orientation of the development of intermaxillary segment. As the maxillary prominences grow and enlarge medially, the two medial nasal prominences merge not only at the surface but also at a deeper level projecting into the roof of the developing oral cavity. The structure formed by the two merged medial prominences forms the intermaxillary segment. The intermaxillary component is composed of a labial component which forms the philtrum of the upper lip, an upper jaw component which carries the four incisor teeth and a palatal component which forms the triangular primary palate. The intermaxillary segment is continuous with the rostral portion of the nasal septum which is formed by the frontonasal prominence. Coming to the development of the palate, the palate develops from two primordia, the primary palate and the secondary palate. Development of palate is called palatogenesis which begins in the 6th week and is completed by 12th week. The critical period of development of the palate is from the end of the 6th week to the beginning of the 9th week. Coming to the primary palate, we have already seen how the primary palate develops. Just to recap, early in the 6th week, the primary palate or median palatine process begins to develop from the deep part of the intermaxillary segment of the maxilla. Initially, this segment is a wedge-shaped mass of mesenchyme between the internal surfaces of the maxillary prominences of the developing maxillae. The primary palate forms the premaxillary part of the maxilla and represents only a small part of the adult hard palate in front of the incisive fossa. Secondary palate is the primordium of both the hard and soft parts of the palate. It appears in the sixth week of development. The primary palate is derived from the intermaxillary segment. The main part of the definitive palate is formed by the two shelf-like projections or outgrowths from the maxillary prominences. These projections are derived from the mesenchyme that extend from the internal aspects of the maxillary prominences and are called the palatine shelves. They are directed obliquely downward on each side of the tongue. In the seventh week, as the jaws develop, the tongue becomes relatively small and moves inferiorly. The palatine shelves elongate, ascend to attain a horizontal position above the tongue. Later, these two palatine shelves fuse and forms the secondary palate. Observe the nasal septum which is elongating towards the palatine shelves. Here you can observe the palatine shelves have fused and has formed the secondary palate separating the oral cavity from the nasal cavities. The nasal septum has fused with the cephalic aspect of the newly formed secondary palate. In these diagrams showing the roof of the oral cavity you can observe how the palatine shelves are growing and extending medially. Anteriorly, the shelves fuse with the triangular primary palate and the point of fusion in the midline between the primary and secondary palates forms the incisive fossa. At the same time as the palatine shelves fuse, the nasal septum 
grows down and joins with the cephalic aspect of the newly formed palate. The right and left palatine shelves have fused with each other in the anterior one third of the palate. The nasal septum is not seen in the anterior two third as we are viewing the palatine shelves from inferior aspect and the nasal septum fuses with them on the superior aspect from the nasal cavity. Since the posterior part is not yet fused, a small part of the nasal septum is seen. The mesoderm in the anterior part of the palate undergo intramembranous ossification and forms the hard palate. In the posterior part, the ossification does not happen and it remains as the soft palate with uvula. The muscles of the soft palate are derived from first and second pharyngeal arches. The nasal septum develops from internal parts of the merged medial nasal prominences and grows downwards and fuses with the palatine process. The fusion between the nasal septum and the palatine processes occurs from anterior to posterior. The fusion becomes anteriorly during ninth week and is completed posteriorly by 12th week, superior to the primordium of heart palate. Thank you for watching till the end. If you like the video, like, share and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.